Here again the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? For the hurt of my poor people I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been? This morning I want to preach more in terms of context rather than content. The Gospel of Jeremiah, the, the book of Jeremiah, the reading that we heard today, is more to me a question of the context and not so much the content. One of the great truths that we have heard preached, proclaimed, testified to, and sung about over and over again is that God will neither fail us nor forsake us. Another great truth that we have been taught is that God will hear and answer prayer. Yet the truth that, uh, that we understand and know is that a number of us, by our own experience, have felt forsaken by God. There have been times when we have felt that God has failed us. There have been times when we have felt that God has not answered our prayers. There have been times when we have been disappointed, frustrated, and even angry with God. Sometimes, beloved, believing in God ain't so easy. Although it's often kept quiet, a number of us who outwardly appear to be the strongest, the most pious, the most well-grounded and self-assured, those are the folks that have difficulties with God. We don't talk about our difficulties. Because we don't want to appear to be disbelievers or ungrateful. Or we don't want to offend or make God angry. All of our lives we have been taught not to doubt or question God. And yet in our heart of hearts we, just like the prophet Jeremiah, have some questions and disappointments and difficulties and sometimes even anger with God. And because of these questions and difficulties and disappointments and anger, we don't feel as close as we'd like. And we are not as sure or secure in our relationship with God as we would like or as others seem to be. If our relationship with God is to be what we really want it to be, if we are to feel as close to God as we would like, if we would have the kind of relationship with God 
that others claim to have or that we see portrayed in the scriptures, one of the issues that we need to face so that it can be fixed is our difficulties and our disappointments and our anger and our frustrations and our questions that we would like to put before God. We will never grow close to God unless we are honest about our problems with God. And I'm going to say something that will shock many of you because it goes against one of the cornerstone beliefs that we have been brought up with and have heard all of our lives. And that statement is, it's all right to question God. Not only is it all right to question God, it's healthy to question God. It's all right because, first of all, God knows everything, especially us. And God knows about our questions. Not asking doesn't mean that they're not there. It only means that we are burying them and submerging them and hiding them and pretending they are not there and covering them up under some religious facade. Secondly, it's all right to question God just like Jeremiah did because there is a difference between questioning God and doubting God. We often confuse questioning God and doubting God. When we doubt, we are saying, I'm not sure if I believe. But when we question, we are saying, I believe but I just don't understand. Dow says, I'm not sure if you are real or true. Questions say, I know that you are real and true. I just don't understand why you do what you do. Doubts are like the termites that eat away at the foundation of the house, but Questions are like repairing, fixing up the house. Doubts are like the breakdown of an engine, but questions are like a tune-up of an engine. Doubts are critical care, but questions are corrective surgery. Doubts lead to confusion, but questions lead to understanding. It's all right to question God. It's all right to question God in the third place because we learn only by asking questions. When two people are trying to build a relationship, they have to ask questions about each other, their likes and their dislikes and their habits and opinions. Those of you who grew up in the era of Star Wars like I did are no doubt familiar with the phrase, may the force be with you. But I submit this morning, St. Thomas, that God is more than some force or energy field that's with me. God is a personality with whom I can build a relationship, to whom I can get close. God is more than a something. God is a somebody. And when you build a relationship with somebody, when you really want to get to know somebody, sometimes you're going to have to ask some questions. Remember, questions are not about doubting, but questions are about learning and understanding. It's all right, just like Jeremiah did, to question God. In the fourth instance, I believe it's all right to question God because 
got vows, God can handle our questions. If God can handle our weaknesses and faults and failings, then God can surely handle our questions. You know, our lives are greater insults to God than our questions. Our gossip and our pettiness are greater insults to God than our questions. Our selfishness and stubbornness are greater insults to God than our questions. Our phoniness and hypocrisy are greater insults to God than our questions. If God can handle everything, we are not and still love us. If our daily sins do not cause God to lose patience with us and strike us dead off the face of the earth, then God is able to love us in spite of our questions. God is not some fragile glass dish that we must protect. God is not some temperamental, short-tempered old tyrant who is easily insulted and offended and will strike us down or punish us or withhold blessings at the slightest provocation. No, God is patient and God is long-suffering and forgiving and understanding. So God can handle our questions. God can handle our difficulties, our frustrations and problems as they arise in our relationship with God. It's all right to question God. It's all right to question God because in the fifth instance, some of the most powerful personalities in Scripture had questions at one time or another for God. That's how they became so close to God. That's how they could remain faithful. When they had difficulties with God, they faced them so that they could be fixed. They didn't pretend that they didn't have them. They were not afraid to express them. They understood that if their relationship was going to grow, and I'm going to help somebody right now in their own relationship, they would have to open up rather than cover up their difficulties. That's what Jeremiah was doing in the text that I read today that we read in our first reading. Jeremiah, the so-called weeping prophet, the son of Hilkiah, had some difficulties with God. And so he brought them to God in order that they might be fixed. And Jeremiah, if you read the book, was a prophet whose writings contained an inordinate number of questions for God. And I think that's what captivated me this week. Because as you read through Jeremiah, he has more questions than answers. It's almost as if Jeremiah must have been saying, Well, God, I know you're always right. And I know that you know how to run your business. But as one of your servants, there's some questions I have about the way you run your business. Jeremiah must have been thinking, I know that you're not obligated to explain your business to me, but as your servant trying to do your will, I could work a little better and feel a little closer to you if you would just clarify something that's been bothering me. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Why does the way of the guilty thrive? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? In other words, why do evil people get along? so well. I believe Jeremiah must have said, you know, they couldn't do it, God, without you. You planted them and they took root. 
They grow and bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouths, yet far from their hearts. But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me and test me. My heart is with you. I'm serving you. I love you so why are you so hard on me? While it seems like the evil ones are getting off so easy. The books of Jeremiah and Lamentations are full of the questions of this prophet. Go back and read them. And he is in a long line of faithful and believing servants openly question God. Abraham, if you remember, was the father of the faithful. Yet when God told Abraham that he and Sarah would have a son in their old age, according to the book of Genesis, Abraham fell on his face and laughed in God's face and asked, can a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? When Moses was called to free the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, he not only questioned God as to what and how and when, but he then asked God to just, why don't you send somebody else? Job, the one to whom we look up with as a long-suffering servant, may have endured his suffering, but not without asking God why over and over again. And the book of Psalms are full of the questions of David. David, who is considered the man after God's own heart. In the 10th Psalm, he asked, Why, O oh Lord, do you stand so far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? If Jonah had had questions, he wouldn't have run away. Here's the prophet of the Bible as well, for instance, who says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? John the Baptist, even as powerful a preacher as he was, had his questions and difficulties with Jesus and asked Jesus, Are you he who is to come? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And even when we turn to the book of Revelation, the souls of slaughtered saints under the altar in heaven ask God, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? And even Jesus on Calvary quoted his ancestor David, who in the 22nd Psalm asked, My God, my God, why? None of these people were faithless. Their questions were a reflection of their effort to grow. So, beloved, if you find yourself asking questions of God, just know that you're in good company. And when Jeremiah asked his question, God did not answer him directly. And when we read the scriptures, we note that most of those who are who question God did not receive direct answers. Yet, they continued to believe. That brings me to my sixth point. It's all right to question God because faith is not faith unless it has some questions. In other words, faith is not simply swallowing everything hook, line, and sinker. Faith is not about having everything worked out in a neat little package or wrapped up in some surefire formula that will work all the time, that has everything settled, all questions answered, and all issues resolved. Faith is not getting everything you pray for every time. It doesn't take faith to believe in a, in a God like that. If God does everything we want God to do when we want God to do it in the way we want God to do it. 
That's why Paul says in Romans, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Beloved, faith does not mean we have no questions. Faith means believing with questions and all. Faith means that God, that when God says yes, we believe. And even when God says no, we believe. And even when we don't know what God is saying, we believe. Faith means believing when we understand and believing when we don't understand. Faith means believing in the bright daylight and believing in life's darkest midnight. Faith means believing when there's not a cloud in the sky and believing even in the midst of the storms. Faith means believing when the water is clear and sparkling and when the water is muddy and murky. Faith is Job declaring, though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. Faith is Habakkuk saying, though the fig tree does not blossom, and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the God of my salvation. Faith, faith is Jesus saying in Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. However you work it out, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Faith is Jesus continuing to hang on Calvary's cross, even though his question is not answered. Some of you may wonder how we keep a faith that believes even when our questions are not answered. Well, first of all, let me say, we trust the purposes of God. I don't know why God does some things or allows some things to happen or puts certain people in the White House, but I believe God has a reason. I trust God's purposes. Paul put it like this, we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. I got some Bible readers in here. The 18th century poet William Cowper put it like this in his poem called Light Shining Out of Darkness. He said, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform, plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. God is too wise to make mistakes and too right to do wrong. So even though we have our questions, we trust the purposes of God. We can believe in God even with our questions. Not just because we trust the purposes of God, but because we trust the promises of God. God promised that though the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. If anybody don't know what that means, that means though the world fall apart. His steadfast love shall not depart from us. God promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. God promised that the righteous would live by faith, the wicked would cease from troubling, and the weary would be at rest. God promised not to be slack concerning those promises. We can believe in God even with our questions. When we trust the purposes of God and we trust the promises of God and finally when we trust the provisions of God. Beloved, that simply means that we know God's going to take care of us. We don't know why our loved one died, but we know God is going to take care of us. We don't know why we lost our job, but we know that God is going to take care of us. 
We don't know why our relationship, our marriage fell apart, but we know God is going to take care of us. We don't know what's going to happen to our children, but when we put them in God's hands, we know that God is going to take care of us. We don't know why God won't heal that sickness in our body, but we know even so God is going to take care of us. We don't know where the money will come from to pay our bills, but we know that God is going to take care of us. We don't know what the future holds. But even in that, we know that God is going to take care of us.